the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Messiah the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Merry Christmas to all of you. I am Father Sony Sebastian, a Divine Word Missionary Priest. I want to wish you and your family and all your loved ones a wonderful celebration of Christmas. You know, we celebrate Christmas every year. And we speak about Christmas also from a very traditional perspective. But this time, I would like to bring Christmas from the perspective of a few characters, few characters that we find in Christmas, like the Blessed Mother Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, King Herod, etc., a few others. The story of the first Christmas is an unbelievable story, humanly speaking. Perhaps no human being on earth understands that better than a young woman named Mary, our Blessed Mother. Let's look at her perspective on Christmas as it is written for us in St. Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. What is the miracle of Christmas? The answer is hinted at the five statements from the angel Gabriel that Luke records for us as he brings the message to the Blessed Mother. First, the angel tells Mary that she is to name the baby Jesus. This is exactly what the angel of the Lord told Joseph in God, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 21. So, in both accounts, we are told that the baby is to be named Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. This was a common name to, be, to give to a Jewish child at the time of Jesus in history. It is the same as the Hebrew name Joshua. Joshua. And the name points to this child as the future savior. The second thing that the Gabriel, that the angel Gabriel says to Mary is that he, meaning Jesus, will be great. Now Gabriel also told Zachariah that the son born to him, namely John the Baptist, would be great in the sight of the Lord. But Jesus' greatness is seen in the title that will be assigned to him. Next, the angel tells Mary why her son will be great. Jesus will be called the Son of the Most High. This title, the Most High, was only given to Yahweh in the Hebrew Scriptures. So the angel was saying, in effect, that this baby, this baby that is going to be born of her, was the very Son of God. Then Gabriel tells Mary that the Lord God will give her son the throne of his father David. In other words, this child will be the Messiah. Furthermore, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. Jesus is the true ruler of the world. So when we put all these things together, we see that the miracle of Christmas is that God became a human being. The miracle of Christmas, to put in, in the language of the Gospel of John, is the miracle of incarnation. 
On a wintry day, as a man was walking down the street, he noticed that someone had thrown a bag of grain out on the ground. A flock of hungry sparrows had monopolized it for an unscheduled feast. The man paused, then took a step in their direction. The birds became uneasy. Another step, and their nervousness increased. When he almost was upon them, upon the birds, the birds suddenly flew away, leaving their feast unfinished. For a few moments, the man stood there reflecting on what had happened. Why had those sparrows scattered in, in flight? He had meant them no harm. Suddenly, the thought came to him, it is yourself. You are too big. Then another question pressed upon his mind. How could he walk among those birds without frightening them? Only if it were possible for him to become a sparrow and fly down among them. The teaching of Christianity is that God wanted to make himself known to us. But he is too big that, he, that if he were to walk among us in all his glory, we would be frightened, just as those sparrows were scared by the man. But God could do everything. He could do something that humans could not do, that we cannot do. The man could not become a sparrow, but God could become one of us. And thus, make himself known to us in a way we could understand. That is the big miracle of Christmas. God chooses to be born like us humans. He chooses to be conceived not by human intervention, but by divine intervention. You know, Mary's question to the angel Gabriel was not how can this be, but rather, how will this be? Mary did not question the authority of Gabriel's pronouncement. She simply wanted to know the mechanics of how she would become pregnant without having any relationship with a person, with a man. Gabriel's response was that the Holy Spirit would come upon and overshadow her, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Thus, the story of the virgin conception is important because it emphasizes Jesus' identity as the Son of God. The angel concludes saying that nothing is impossible with God. Mary, Mary remains an example of true and simple faith in God and in his ways. She never boasted about her position as the mother of God, the chosen one. She dedicated her life completely to the service of others. We see her traveling to her cousin Elizabeth's house as soon as she comes to know of her pregnancy. She goes through the struggle of traveling to Bethlehem in the fullness of her own pregnancy. Later, the hardships Joseph and Mary had to endure, finding a place. She was contented to see her child lying in a manger. I'm sure she must have doubted the promise of God at least for a moment when she saw her son in the manger among the animals. How could she, her child, the Lord of everything, and the Son of God be lying in a manger? It surely was a moment of contradictions, but she believes in the power of God. Running away with the child to Egypt to save him from Herod, you know, that was also so, so difficult for both of them. They had to carry the child, they had to protect him, and at the same time also had to find a place. They were foreigners, they were immigrants in a way trying to seek asylum in a foreign land. But she does. Not only she, she and Joseph does everything to fulfill as well as to obey 
submitting to the will of God. Everything was a true gamble with her own life, you know. But she trusts, she embraces the hardships, struggles, pain, loss, and persecution, denials, all in order to fulfill her commitment and acceptance of God's promise. Yes, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Now let's look at Christmas from the perspective of Joseph. You know, Christmas is always a challenge to a certain extent. It poses some challenges that we share with a man who lived 2,000 years ago. And that man's name is Joseph. And his story is told in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Matthew tells us that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. It is important to understand what was involved in the Jewish wedding pro procedure or process in the first century during the time of Christ. There were three steps. First, there was the engagement. This was often arranged by the parents or a professional matchmaker when the persons to be engaged were still children. Sometimes the persons to be engaged did not even know each other. The second step was the betrothal. This is what we might call the ratification of the engagement. At this point, the engagement initiated by the parents could be broken if the boy or the girl was unwilling to go ahead with it. However, once the betrothal was established, it was binding. The betrothal period lasted for one year. During that time period, the couple was known as husband and wife. However, there were, you know, they had no sexual relations uh, during, that, during the time of betrothal. The only way to break a betrothal was by divorce. If one partner had sexual relations, relationship with uh, another person during the betrothal period, it was considered as adultery and was punishable by stoning. It was so beautifully explained in the book of Deuteronomy. So Joseph and Mary were in betrothal period as the Jewish wedding pro, you know, process. When they discovered that Mary was, or when J Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant. The third stage was the marriage proper, which took place at the end of the year of betrothal, when the couple would come together and consummate the marriage. This was usually accompanied uh, you know, by a week of fast, uh, feasting, not fasting, sorry. We have you know, the example of this kind of a wedding at the wedding of Cana. So accepting Mary, who was already with child before their marriage, meaning living together was a disgrace for Joseph. So also, in addition to the challenge of disgrace, Joseph faced the challenge of a decision. From that point of view, the message of the angel was an awesome message because Joseph must have been relieved to know that Mary had not wronged him or forsaken him. He was probably overjoyed to find out that the Lord wanted him to go ahead with the marriage, an action that was in keeping with his great affection for Mary. But Joseph must have been awestruck as he considered who this baby was going to be. He was to be named Jesus, which means Yahweh saves Joshua. And as Matthew explains to us, this baby was Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This baby, Mary's baby, was God in the flesh. At the same time, Joseph had to make a big decision to accept Mary as well as to protect Jesus, the God child. The struggle and pain, the moment of dejection and rejection he went through to find a place for Mary to give birth to her firstborn, the disgrace he endured to find only a stable, 
but must have been also the feeling of greatness when the first visitors, the shepherds came to visit the child. So also the Magi from the East, you know, the kings, he must have been awestruck receiving those beautiful, valuable and expensive gifts. He was not able to fathom the depth and immensity of his God child. And that is the perspective of Christmas from the perspective, from the viewpoint of Joseph. Now let's look at Christmas from the viewpoint, the first perspective of the shepherds. It is also interesting to note who celebrated the first Christmas, you know, and who did not. The first Christmas was not celebrated by, you know, Emperor Caesar Augustus, nor Quirinius, you know, we have the references of Augustus and Quirinius from the account of the Gospel of Luke, the governor of Syria. Nor was it celebrated by the lowly innkeeper, but Christmas was celebrated by a few lonely shepherds along with Joseph and Mary and the host of angels from heaven. How amazing that the Lord would announce his birth of his son, not to the emperor, not to the governor, but rather to simple shepherds. Shepherds were nobodies in social structure of ancient Near East at that time, you know. They were not able to testify in courts of law because their testimony was considered to be unreliable. They were not educated. Shepherds were among the people of the land. They had no formal education and thus could not even read the scriptures. It was to such people as this that God announced the birth of his only begotten son. Let's read the story of Jesus' birth from the perspective of the shepherds as it is written for us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 20. First, the shepherds received the good news that a child was born. The child was not born simply for Mary and Joseph. This child was born for the shepherds and for all of us, for the whole universe. This child was born to be the Messiah, the king who would inherit the, inherit the throne of David and reign forever. This child was and is the Lord. Secondly, we see here that the shepherds responded immediately to the good news. They didn't debate the reality of the angels, you know, and angels' message and put off going to Bethlehem. They ran to the Savior. Luke tells us they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. No one had to tell the shepherds to run to the Savior. No one had to invite them to respond this way. It was their natural response once they heard the good news. As we catch a glimpse of Jesus from the scriptures, we can be transformed just as the shepherds were long ago. Luke tells us, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it, were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned praising God. The shepherds didn't give up their job or their families to become missionaries to some remote part of the world. They went back to their normal lives, back to their daily routines, back to the responsibility God had given them of shepherding and raising their families. But the shepherds went back as changed people. What was the shepherd's perspective on Christmas? It can be summed up in one word, in one word, and that is joy. They received the good news of a great joy. They responded with joy, ran with joy, relayed the word with joy, and returned with joy, praising God. That is the perspective of, you know, of Christmas of the shepherds. 
Now let's look at the the at Christmas from the perspective of a great personality, Herod, and so also the Magi, the three kings from the east. At the time of Jesus' birth, Judea was under the rule of King Herod. Herod was an opportunist and rose to power while taking advantage of the Roman political unrest. He became close to the Octavian, who later on became the famous Roman emperor Augustus Caesar. Herod came to power and developed the Jerusalem city into an important trading hub and also developed a port city called Caesarea. Herod reigned for 37 years and died after Jesus was born. The true nature of Herod is visible from the account that we read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In Judea, Magi were known for their skill and wisdom. The same night that Jesus was born, three wise men were traveling across the desert because they saw a star shining very brightly in the sky. They tried to know its significance in numerous scrolls and chants. They understood it as the sign that the king of the Jews has been born. The three wise men, Balthasar, Melchior, and Gaspar, went to King Herod to ask where the child could be found. The birth of Jesus or the new king of Jews made King Herod uneasy. King Herod was afraid of losing his power and was intent to kill the newborn child. He asked the three wise men to look for the child and to inform him as soon as the child is found. The three wise men set out in their search for the king of the Jews. Following the direction of the star, they arrived at the manger in Bethlehem, where they knelt down before the Son of God. They brought him the gifts that they had brought with them, gold, frankincense, and myrrh to offer to the Holy Child. Mary thanked them for their gifts. The wise men worshipped Jesus. When the wise men found Jesus, they acted without hesitation. They threw themselves on the ground before him in an expression of humility and homage. In the ancient world, gold was the most common gift for royalty. So this gift recognized Jesus' kingship. Frankincense was an incense used by priests to worship. Worship God in the temple. So this gift points us towards Jesus' priestly role as our mediator before God. More. Myrrh is a spice used in embalming the dead. This gift is prophetic of Jesus' suffering and death, endured on the cross to save us from our sins. Matthew spends a significant portion of Jesus' nativity account focusing on Herod. And in fact, from both a narrative and a theological standpoint, Herod is essential to the story of Christmas. Herod called a secret meeting to learn all he could from the Magi's experience with the star. It's so sad to see that a man who was ruling in the area where God's people worshipped helped them renovate their temple and was familiar with their expectations was set on preserving his own power and legacy rather than being excited about the fulfillment of God's greatest promise. Herod's plan was foiled, so he reacted as only he was expected to react in such a situation. He reacted in a fit of rage. Unlike Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, and the Magi, who all submitted to the Savior and worshipped him. Herod was a different story. He reacted in fear to the news of 
a rival to his throne. He used deception to try and trick the Magi into revealing Jesus' position. He resorted to destruction to try and eliminate his competition. Gifts communicate how much a person matters to us. The wise men gave themselves to Jesus. God gave Jesus to the world, to us. When the wise men recognized the significance of his birth, they traveled far and put their lives on the line in recognition of who he was or who Christ is. They gave him costly gifts, but beyond that, they took a major risk. They gave their time and effort. They invested more than their words and more even than their treasures. They gave themselves. God's gift to us is Jesus. His birth shows how much God values us. What is our gift or what is our response to him? He deserves our loyalty, our obedience, our worship. He deserves our very life. There's a story told of a 10-year-old girl who went with her family and friends to see the Christmas light and displays around the town. At one church, they stopped and got out to look more closely at a beautiful nativity scene. Isn't that lovely? Asked the grandmother. Look at all the animals, Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. Yes, grandma, the girl replied. It's really nice, so beautiful. But there's one thing that bothers me, grandma. Isn't baby Jesus ever going to grow up? He's the same size he was last year. Yes, Jesus needs to grow. He needs to grow in us to make Christmas meaningful. Jesus' birth affected many more people than the ones we see in Christmas. Without Jesus in the manger, we would not have Jesus on the cross. Without Jesus on the cross, we would not have salvation and we would still be separated from God. The Christmas story is one of prayers answered and miracles witnessed, promises fulfilled and hope restored. It's an old story and yet it's always a new story. It's Jesus' story and of course it's our story. Wish you all a Merry Christmas.